Well, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate the ministry here of music today, uh, certainly. And it is a blessing that we're able to come to worship like this and uh, join our hearts together this morning. We are going to be in the book of Mark chapter 4 as we continue our series in Mark. And what I would like for you to do is to turn with me there to Mark chapter 4. And we'll pick this up in verse 35. So I'd like to take you on a trip across the Sea of Galilee this morning. So would you stand with me as I read a few verses here, please? Starting there in verse 35. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. And Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith. They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Father, we ask that, Lord, you just bless this passage today. As we explore the meaning of this passage, help us, Father, to see the contrast between fear and faith. And may we be equipped today as we leave here this morning to have a deeper faith and trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this now in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this is a very important uh, event here in the book of Mark as we stop and consider the life and the progression of discipleship that's being uh, kind of in time uh, built upon. That is, the level of discipleship uh, really begins with understanding who Jesus is and then understanding uh, exactly what Jesus is asking me to do. Uh, we have witnessed as we would put together the entirety of our time here in Mark, starting in chapter 1, we witnessed some fantastic miracles where Jesus is casting out demons and he is healing people and there has just been a whole host of wonderful miracles that Jesus has done. And from the point of view from the disciples, they're looking at Jesus and they're thinking to themselves, and this is an ongoing process in their mind, no doubt, who is this Jesus that is able to do these types of miracles? Is he a great prophet? We know that if, from a Jewish perspective, as they look back to the Old Testament, they see in the Old Testament prophets who were capable of doing amazing miracles. And yet, as they're looking at Jesus, they're wondering, is he indeed a prophet, or is it indeed something much more than that? So stop and think about that, if you would. Here we are. It's been a long day already. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about in Jesus' day. The Bible says there that when evening came, Jesus spoke to the disciples and said, let's go to the other side. You know, when Jesus would teach, the crowds would become enormous. People had spiritual needs. Their hearts were full of uncertainty. They weren't sure about this Jesus, and they wanted to hear every single word that he said. They were also very concerned about maybe having some healing done because there was illness across the land as there is today, and Jesus was the one person who could intervene, and he could offer healing. We understand that the crowd was so great that what Jesus would do in order to be able to teach is he would go out in a boat just slightly offshore. And he would speak to the crowd, allowing his voice to hit the water and disperse among the hearers. And they could hear the words that he said and they could digest the thoughts that he was presenting to them. He would do this all day long. And it has been a long, long day. Jesus has been teaching them. He's there in the boat, and he's teaching them. And when finally evening comes, the disciples are thinking to themselves, whew, this has been a long day. I'm glad it's done. And they're thinking to themselves, I wonder where we're going to get food, you know? I mean, where are we going to eat? I mean, I, from a human perspective, that's what I would be thinking. Are you with me? And Jesus turns to them, and he says, 
I want to go to the other side of the sea. And so they probably looked at each other and they probably thought to themselves, where? You see, the Sea of Galilee is about eight miles wide. And back in those days, the boats were equipped with diesel power. As long as one of the, as long as one of the disciples is named Diesel, you get it. You see, the problem is they're either going to sail across or they're going to what? Row across, exactly. And so this was not going to be an easy proposition. It's been a long day, as I already pointed out, and it's starting to get dark. And when you're in the dark on a boat, there's a lot of uncertainty, isn't there? How many have been on a boat after dark? A small boat after dark. A small boat with no lights after dark. A small boat in the dark with no lights in a storm. Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? I started working as a little kid. I, I started working. My first job I had, I was 12 years old because I wanted to buy a boat. And uh, I bought a wooden boat, wooden lap strake, exactly. No fiberglass whatsoever on this boat. Leaked like a sieve to start with. But it was all right. I'd put enough coats of paint on it to slow it down. You know what I mean? And then I was able to buy an old junk, I mean, an old uh, 40 horsepower motor, and I uh, had that on that boat. And I had two friends, both of them were from the city up near Boston, and one was from a ghetto up there. And I took these two boys out, and I thought, I'll have a chance to witness to them, and we're going to go out fishing all night long <laughs> on a boat with no lights and no cell phones and no GPSs. Alas, I did have a compass. It was one of those woo, woo, woo type compasses, but I had a compass, you know what I mean? If you could just hold it still long enough, you might be able to see what direction you were going. So I had this grandiose plan that I was going to travel 30 miles, fish my way across Cape Cod Bay, get to a place called Provincetown, and refuel before dark. I mean, like, really dark. But I only got two-thirds of the way. It was already dark, and the waves were 68-footers. And it was brutal. I finally turned around. Now I had a problem because I'm running out of fuel. And, but that's okay. We can deal with that. Um, I have two friends there <laughs> and a paddle. So we started on our way back. And I remember standing there. And the, this little wooden lapstrake boat had a windshield across and the sides. And one of my hands was on the windshield and the other was on the, on the steering wheel. And we would go about every other wave and the bow would dip down. And it, it's kind of scary when white water comes over your bow. There was no white water. It was green water. I'm telling you what, it was full swoop. And it would come and it would roll right on up the windshield. And it would hit that windshield. And I'd crouch down just a little bit. And that big wave would go right over my head and land on my buddies in the back. <laughs> I told them they needed to start bailing because the bilge pump wasn't keeping up with the water and we were starting to fill with water. And now it's pitch black and I have no navigational aids whatsoever. There's no sun, stars, moon, nothing. It's just black. And I am going in the general direction of where I think home is and my inspiring confidence as, as I was navigating along the way, somewhere along the way, I, I started to navigate more towards the east. And I didn't realize that at the time, but I noticed that there was something in front of us. And we were traveling at a very slow rate of speed because, as I said, these waves are coming over the windshield. About every other wave put one over the windshield. And, and I, I started to see something enormous and, and black, jet, jet black in front of me. And I thought, what is that? Is that? And there was a target ship in the middle of Cape Cod Bay, and I was afraid that it might be the target ship. And I'd run into the target ship, which was 250 feet long or something and, and 40 feet high. Uh, but alas, it wasn't that. It was a pile of rocks. Now, there's two things about that pile of rocks when I noticed it was a pile of rocks that were good. One, I'd slowed down enough so I didn't hit them. And number two, I knew exactly where I was. I eventually navigated my home, to, to the home port. I, I actually hit the, the north side of Cape Cod Bay. I was within five miles of where I wanted to be, so it wasn't too bad. And eventually, we were able to run out of gas and pull the boat into the harbor which I'd done a number of times and was very experienced at. <laughs> it is true that when you're on a boat and there's an adventure like that and it's exciting, it's um, kind of interesting. And I remember the, one of my buddies that was in the back, he was a Catholic boy and he just never stopped doing this. And I, <laughs> I kept telling him, listen, you got to quit doing that and you got to start bailing or else we are going to be in trouble. 
The disciples are on this boat, and the Bible says that as they went across the Sea of Galilee, a fierce gale came up. And the storm was so great that in Mark, uh, he is describing it to a T, that as the fierce winds began to blow, the boat was swamping with water. And it was beginning, as he says, to fill up. Now, at this point in time, we find that Jesus is on a boat. There are several boats, evidently, because Mark even mentions the fact that there were a few different boats. Jesus is in one boat, obviously, with some of the disciples, and some of the other disciples are probably in another boat, two boats, three boats, whatever it might have been like. But Jesus left his teaching, it says, just as he was. In other words, he never went back to shore. They just departed right from there across. And as they were going across, they developed problems. Sea of Galilee can be at times very, very calm. But on the other side, the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, there are some big hills and maybe this picture doesn't capture it as much as I'd like, but there were, there were passageways or rocky valleys that came down from these hills. And the storms would build and the wind would rush down the face of that cliff and it would come bearing down on the Sea of Galilee and it would create enormous storms. And unfortunately, I have an illustration uh, that demonstrates how these storms can come up. And this is a headline that's just taken out of our week's news. You may have heard about the great disaster with the duck boat in Missouri and how many died, how many died in one family. It was a tragic, tragic event. And how many have seen that video on TV where those duck boats are plodding through waves that are over my head? And you sit there and you think to yourself, wow, how did it get so rough? In such a small area, how is it even possible that it would get like that? And it's very possible, unfortunately, to have that happen. We would much prefer a calm scenario. How nice it would have been to row across the Sea of Galilee with the moonlight on you and how wonderful and peaceful it could have been. But that's not the situation that we encounter here. Notice with me as we look at this passage that as the storm comes up and the waves are breaking over the boat, again, Mark is so descriptive. Jesus is in the stern and he is asleep on the cushion, which if you had someone who was an honored guest on your boat, you would put that cushion down in the stern. And it's interesting here that Jesus has enough peace and enough security that he's able to just easily go to sleep. They come to him finally and they wake him up. And they cry out to him because of the predicament that they find themselves in. As we look at this, the first point that I want to press this morning is the fact that in this passage, we see the power of Jesus over nature. And it demonstrates his greatness, does it not? You see, up until this time, there have been some pretty amazing things taking place. Jesus has done some amazing miracles. But here we are in this passage, and we are seeing Jesus encounter the fury of nature. And this is going to be, in the mind of the disciples, a real testing ground. I don't believe for a moment that they thought that Jesus was going to be able to still the waves uh, like he did and be able to create a salvation of sorts. I don't think they really even realized that. Mark is very open about it as he describes the attitude of these men who are very, very afraid. When they called on Jesus, Jesus got up, the Bible says, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. You know when those exact words are used over in Mark chapter 1, verse 25? When Jesus is teaching in the synagogue and that demoniac, that person who has a demon inside of him, stands up and begins screaming. I mean, that must have been quite a scene, right? We, we've kind of talked about that already. But Jesus basically said, I rebuke you, hush, be still. It's the same exact verbiage in the Greek in chapter 125 as we see here in chapter 4, which really makes you wonder if there's some demonic presence in this storm, that maybe the source of this was demonic. And Jesus recognizes, but the power that Jesus has to cast that demon out is the same power that he has over nature. Nature 
And the fury of nature is truly amazing to us as human beings. Isn't it true? The power of storms. Do you like to watch the Weather Channel? And you see those tornadoes, and you see the, the earthquakes, and right now there's volcanoes in Hawaii, and you see all of these things that are going on, and it is pretty dramatic, isn't it? And we look at the power that is displayed within nature itself, and we realize as we look at this passage that Jesus is Lord of all of it, that Jesus is still more powerful than the greatest wind that's ever blown the largest wave that's ever been seen. He is more powerful than the earthquakes. He's more powerful than that volcano. And in the power of Jesus Christ, he stills the sea and demonstrates his greatness. Truly he alone is Lord of all. The second thing I want you to see here is that the power of Jesus over nature demonstrates that we can trust Jesus with our lives here and in the future. The disciples look at Jesus and they make this comment. And the comment is a very strong one. Master, don't you even care? You see, at this point, they are very fearful. In fact, we would look at this verse, and if you notice verses 40 and 41, after Jesus stills the waves, he said to them, why are you afraid? Maybe he could have said it, why are you still afraid? You were afraid before, and now you're still afraid. Why, why are you afraid? Notice verse 41, they became very afraid. After Jesus stills the sea, and it's calm enough to water ski barefoot on, they are still terrified. Do you know, if you look at verse 40, and you like to write in your notes of your Bible, the question that Jesus asked, why are you still afraid, is actually one Greek word for the word afraid, and then Mark uses a different Greek word for that whole aspect there of the fact that they were still very much afraid. Why are they so afraid? Have you ever asked yourself that thought? Well, I believe that what we see here is that there is, without question, because they became very afraid, a realization on their part of who Jesus is. They are looking there, trying to figure this out. Who exactly is this Jesus? Is he the prophet? Is he the anointed one? What does that mean? What is the impact of this? After they witness him stilling the sea, and they see the power over nature, I think some of them are looking at it, and they are thinking to themselves, who is on this boat with me? Is this God on this boat with me? And the Bible says they're fearful, but it's a different kind of fear. Do you see that? The Greek words are different. Before they were fearing for their life, they thought they were going to go down to Davy Jones' locker. And now they're looking at it and they're wondering, who in the world is this in this boat with us? He is far greater than any prophet of the Old Testament. Yes, those prophets in the Old Testament did miracles, but he is able to, to do things that we've never seen, we've never heard of before. This is truly amazing. Imagine what it would be like to come to the realization that Jesus is God himself and he's present with you in that boat. What would your reaction be? Oh, great to have you on board. I'm pretty sure we would all be fairly terrified for the implications of God himself with us is enormous, isn't it? Now the question is for us today, what will our reaction be? Would we be a disciple full of fear or would we be a disciple that's full of faith? Let me submit to you this morning that following Jesus has always been risky. It's always been risky. Following Jesus means a departure from life as it has been. There has been enough accounting already here in this short time we've been in Mark. Jesus' own family, they were ready to have him committed because they thought he was mentally unstable. The religious leaders were against him. 
As a follower of Jesus Christ, I needed to understand if I was one of those disciples that following Jesus is a high-risk proposition. I was all up for a day at the shore. You know what I'm saying? I am all up with that. Jesus can make us lunch. We've seen him do this before. He's teaching the multitudes. They're all happy with him. This is a great day. I am on the boat with Jesus, or at least one of the boats there that's near Jesus. I've got a front row seat. I am pretty special as a disciple. Do you know what I mean? And here's what happens. Jesus decides to go across the lake, and here we are in the midst of a storm, and we're ready to die. Following Jesus has always had high risk associated with it. And I think we've been guilty in modern Christianity of trying to smooth out that risk and, and make a Christianity that's a lot more tolerable for the masses. That really doesn't have that much risk associated with it. It's, it's kind of an easy thing, you know? It's just, it's an easy living type of proposition. Do you want to go to heaven? Yeah, okay, all right. But what about being a real follower of Jesus? What about really opening my heart up to Jesus and saying, Jesus, Lord, I will take the lead from you, and I will go, and I will follow you, even if it leads me into a massive storm where I am scared to death and needing to trust you. Jesus looked at the disciples, and he said, what? You still don't have faith? You really thought I was going to let you drown. I've been telling you all along about this spiritual kingdom of God. Why would I let us all drown? Do you not have faith that I am God and able to keep this from happening? When we look at our own faith and our own walk with the Lord, we need to see the need to follow his leading, even if it means we are at times going to need to be trusting him fully. We trusted him, we placed our faith in him for salvation. And he requires that we follow him from that day forward. Brother Steve pointed out that as he goes to Pennsylvania, he's going because God is leading him there. God is leading him there, he's prayed about it, but it's risky, isn't it? It's risky, right, Steve? It's risky. But he's a servant of the Lord. There will be times when he will be terrified, and there will be times when he will need to come to his senses and say, I need to have faith in God and what he's doing. Following Christ is always just like that. I can't smooth it out for you. I can't make it into something it's not. Really being a follower of Christ involves a commitment to him that allows him to take us in places where we're not all that comfortable at times. Yielding to the Lord. What would you have me do, Lord? Where would you have me go? Critical question that the disciples asked Jesus. Teacher, it's used about 12 times in the New Testament. Do you not care that we're perishing? Now you could read that and you can try to smooth that out, but from Mark's standpoint and the other gospel writers smooth this over and try to make it a little bit more palatable. But do you see the cut here that Mark is, is putting into this? Teacher, do you not care that we're dying here? That was the realistic question that was brought to Jesus. And it's not an unusual question. And in the tone that I just said that, it's not that unusual among Christians either. Oftentimes, Christians will ask that very question with that very tone. As we go through life and there are many, many storms, we sometimes wonder, where is Jesus? Where are you? Where have you gone? Where, what am I to do now? And it brings to bear our faith in Jesus Christ. Last couple days, I read this book. It's called Out of the Depths. Can I just tell you, this book is phenomenal. It's written by a man who's in his 90s now. His name's Edgar Harrell. He wrote it along with his son, David. His son, David, is a Bible-preaching pastor in Tennessee. He and I have something in common. The two of us are sons of survivors of the USS Indianapolis. 
His father writes from a perspective, and this is why it was such a blessing to read this book. His father writes as a believer. His dad was saved. He was actually uh, grew up in the church, but never truly made a commitment to Christ until he was 19. That's when he looks as, as the time of his salvation. He's 21 years old as one of the 39 Marines that were on the Indy when it sank. Greatest naval disaster in U.S. history. He talks about this, and he, he talks about the difficulties. He says um, that when the torpedo hit, it basically removed the bow of the boat. The bow of the ship was gone, and the twin propellers were still turning, and so you can imagine as that boat was thrust through the water, that ship was beginning to fill. He says, by now men were being washed overboard. The front half of the ship was completely underwater. It was nearly impossible to stand on the open deck because of her severe list to the starboard. And when word to abandon finally reached the quarter deck, many men ran to the high side, the port side, and began jumping off. He says, it was bedlam. In the light of the flames, I could see men jumping on top of each other. It was so far down that when they jumped on someone else, oftentimes that person died. He said, I recall making my way to the port side and hanging onto the rail to keep from fa falling due to the steep incline. And as I stood there, I looked out into the blackness of night and then at the pitch black oil that had already started to leak from the Indy floating on the water below. That moment is indelibly etched in my mind. The stark reality of what was really happening flooded my senses. I was face to face with my mortality. Eternity was before me and in the midst of my fear and helplessness, I cried out to God in prayer. As I was reading this book and thinking about the message today, I thought, wow, how similar. How similar. He goes on to write, anyone who has ever experienced a similar situation will understand what I'm about to say. There are times when you pray, and there are times when you pray. Right? This was one of those latter times. No one offered to help me because no one else could help me. I was there alone. Isn't that the disciples? On that ship in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, who's going to help them? If it's not Jesus, then who? They were all alone. He says, I was there all alone, or so it seemed. But as I reached out in desperation to the Savior of my soul, he suddenly made it clear to me that he was also going to be the Savior of my life. He said, there was no audible voice. Something far more comforting was given to me suddenly. An unexplainable and ineffable peace enveloped me like a blanket on a frosty night. With the undeniable marks of the supernatural, the chill of terror was replaced with a glowing warmth of divine assurance. I knew within my heart that God was answering my prayers and was going to see me through. This book is filled with this man's answers to prayer. As he looked at that, he looked at the many who were there who were sinking into the darkness and he says, desperation and fear only worsened in the first night as the blackness of night enveloped our quivering bodies. The darkness seemed to isolate us in our misery, preventing us from even seeing the guy next to us. For some of the men, there was nothing to bring hope, and without hope, all that's left is despair. But for me, hope never waned. And I do not say that to my credit, but to God's. You see, being out on the ocean or being out on the sea has its blessings, but it also has its real challenges. I think of Psalm 107, verse 24, and the rest of that chapter, where it says, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose to the heavens and they went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. As those disciples were in that boat, they realized that they were going to sink and they realized with that they would perish. All the while, Jesus was sleeping in the stern of that boat, the Bible says, on a cushion. When they woke him up, they asked him, don't you care that we perish? And of course, he stilled the waves. Had they not woken up Jesus, they would have indeed perished. 
In fact, all of us find ourselves enveloped in the storms of life, and our greatest storm that we're dealing with is our own sin. The world doesn't realize it many times, but it is in danger of sinking. The imminence is clear. And the only one who can save them is Jesus. But just as Jesus was sleeping in the stern of that boat, Jesus is there, but he's not going to force himself upon them. The disciples needed to reach out. They needed to wake up Jesus, and fortunately did, just in the nick of time, or else they would have perished. The world needs to see that Jesus is not going to force himself into their life, but that they need to call upon him. The Bible tells us whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe you're here today and you recognize that there are some some pretty big needs in your life. There's holes in your life. You're not satisfied. You don't see a purpose in this life. You have questions about the future. You have uncertainty in your heart. You're not certain of where you'll spend your eternity. You are going through a very great storm. The only one who can still the waves is Jesus. He's the only one who can give you peace that passes all understanding. He's the only one that can calm your sea and give you something of substance to live for. He's the only one who can forgive your sin and deliver you from the consequence of that sin. Jesus and Jesus alone. If you're here today and you've never called on him, just like the disciples called on him, to be delivered, then there is no greater opportunity that lies before you than right now. Would you call upon his name and be saved? Maybe you are a follower already of Jesus Christ. You've called upon him. One thing I learned as a young man was that even though I have faith in Jesus Christ, the waves don't always disappear. That life is just filled with a storm from time to time. We're going through storms. Some of you are going through physical storms. Some of you haven't Uh, seen the storm yet, but you know it's on the horizon. Others have just come out of a storm. The truth of the matter is we're all going to go through those stormy periods. That question, Jesus, don't you care, is a viable viable question. I was thinking as I read that verse of the old hymn, does Jesus care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song? As burdens press and the cares distress, and the way grows weary and long. And I love the chorus. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, a long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. My friends, Jesus Christ cares for you tremendously. And he is there if you will call on him. Don't be like the disciples trying to bail with everything you can find before finally calling on Jesus to deliver you. David Harrell, the son of Edgar Harrell, writes this poem, and it's derived from an exposition of Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Life is filled with gale force winds that cause the waves to roar, and like the men of Galilee, we strain against the oar. With billows high, we cry aloud, O Lord, where have you gone? And then he whispers through the squall, I've been here all along. We of little faith, why doubt? Why give our hearts to fear? For when the tempest trials blow, tis then we must draw near. For in the wind of every storm, a sovereign eye doth see the waning faith and broken hearts of those like you and me. And with his outstretched hand of love, he reaches down to save all who trust in him alone. For us, his life he gave. So when the tumults o'er us roll, let's thank him for the gale. For in his love, he caused the storm. T'was he who set the sail. Let's stand and have a word of prayer, shall we? If you're here and you have a desire to talk with someone or pray with someone after the service. We have personal workers that will be here that would love to, to answer any questions you might have or just uh, maybe pray. Maybe you're going through a sorrowful time and you just want to pray with someone. Uh, they're here for you to do that with.
And again, if you're here today and you've yet to place your faith in the Lord, I urge you to call out before that ship sinks. Father, we thank you for being with us here this morning. May you truly bless, Lord, as we contemplate the ramifications of this amazing miracle. May we see in Jesus the power to deliver us. May we see in him the one who we can trust. May we see in him, Lord, the one who loves us so deeply. Work in our hearts, I pray. and Use us for your honor and glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to just encourage you as you're leaving.